Okay, um, so let's start. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, the Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and the Social Sciences is a series of discussions uh, that we've had uh, over the past uh, several months with specialists and practitioners on topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. This is the eighth session. Uh, if you've missed any of the previous session, uh, they are posted on YouTube. Uh, there's information on our website. Um, our panels discuss all sorts of topics, educational and procedural barriers that might slow down adoption of reproducible practices, whether journals or institutions, or today, funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, uh, whether and how scientists work can be made to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage, and implications for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. Um, my name is Lars Wilhieber, and I'm today's moderator, as well as the co-PI of this project, jointly with Alexander Mishuda, who couldn't be here today. Um, Marie Connolly and Ian Schmuddy, Ian is here on the call as well, are members of the organizing committee, and Sarah Brooks is who organized all these things. Uh, they'll be on most, mute for most of the, this panel, um, but uh, Ian will be monitoring the QA and relaying any questions to the panelists as we go through. So please do uh, ask questions in the Q&A. So let me introduce my, my panelists. Um, Martin Halbert uh, is the NSF Science Advisor for Public Access. In this role, he leads the programmatic activities of the National Science Foundation aimed at advancing the understanding and adoption of open science practices, utilizing public access mechanisms, and agency efforts to ensure that research products arising from NSF-funded projects are publicly accessible. Uh, Martin has an interdisciplinary PhD from Emory University, and his research and areas of expertise include open science policy, scientific research repositories, research support services, and strategies for building interinstitutional collaborative alliances to advance new research functions. Thanks for coming, Martin. Sebastian Martinez is the director of evaluation at 3IE, where he leads the generation of high quality policy relevant evidence through impact evaluations and applied research. He has over 15 years of experience producing and using rigorous evidence to inform decision-making for a more effective economic development. He has led more than 40 impact evaluations and conducted training on causal inference and applied research methods for hundreds of professionals in government developments and banks, NGOs and research institutions. Welcome, Sebastian. Thank you for coming. And finally, Stuart Buck is the executive director of the Good Science Project. Uh, he's previously spent years at the Arnold Ventures, where he was deeply engaged in issues involving scientific reproducibility, for instance, launching the Center for Open Science, Vivli, the Stanford Center for Reproducible Neuroscience, and more. Thank you, Stuart, for coming as well. So um, let me start with a question to you, Martin. Um, in the social science, at least SBE, which I know more, uh, social and behavioral uh, ec and economic sciences at NSF, NSF currently requires sharing of data via data management plans and of output documents via the NSF public access repository. There are currently no requirements to provide code explicitly. One could treat them as part of the data management plans, uh, nor to show that that code actually works. I've heard often on panels that that's sort of delegated to uh, reviewers of journal articles where NSF uh, research will inevitably be, be published. Um, can you elaborate a bit on the rationale so far up to today uh, at NSF on this topic, possibly relating to some of the other agencies as well? It's a fantastic question, Lars. Thank you for it. Um, uh, NSF uh, very much is thinking about these issues right now, so it's a very timely question. Uh, as everybody knows, NSF funds research in virtually all areas of science and technology. And uh, we as an agency, I think, are characterized by really paying close attention to the guidance of our of the different disciplines that we serve and thinking about uh, these issues and with guidance from the field. Um, we are also informed about this thinking in, in terms of uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And a very influential report from recently 2019 uh, called Reproducibility and Replicability in Science was a very um, informative uh, study that has, in, has just 
made it given us a lot to think about recently about these things, especially this question of code. Um, so in in the capacity that I serve in at NSF, uh, I oversee both practical operational uh, implementation of uh, the NSF PAR, the public access repository that the NSF maintains. Uh, as you said, we uh, have requirements in our annual reporting for currently only peer-reviewed publications. Uh, soon, with when the um, stipulations of the Nelson Memorandum from last year are implemented in 2025, we will also be requiring the data sets undergirding such publications. But you are quite right, we do not currently require uh, underlying code be submitted for public access. Uh, this may very well change in the future, though. We, in um, NSF annual reporting, if you are an NSF awardee, you're familiar with the research.gov RPPR system for research progress reporting. And there, in that system, there are some two dozen different research output formats that researchers can report on internally to NSF. Again, currently, we only require for public access peer-reviewed publications, but one of the categories that you can report on currently internally to these uh, NSF progress reports is software. Now, some of the questions that pertain to, you know, how would we implement a requirement for public dissemination, public access to software and code uh, is very much a, a set of questions of, well, how, how do we want such code to be cited, made accessible, and so forth. Very frequently, code, research code that's developed in the course of projects uh, is, uh, you know, often considered ephemeral or, you know, rapidly developing in lots of different versions. So, you know, the, uh, the question of which version, which snapshot, so to speak, of the code would be required for this public access is one that we would want to think very carefully about. Uh, in that NASEM, uh, NASEM report that I was quoting, uh, and I think that we, if we can put the links to some of these things, Sarah, in the uh, chat for reference, that would be great. Uh, in that NASEM report, they differentiated, on the one hand, uh, they, they broke out a reproducibility on the one hand and referred to it in terms of computational reproducibility, basically obtaining consistent computational results using the same input data and computational steps and models and so forth. They then went on, I, I think, to usefully uh, talk about replicability, which involves you know, using code uh, and applying it to new data collection and using similar methods as previous studies to extend it. And then finally, generalizability of uh, results to the extent that a study can apply in other contexts or populations different from the original one. So we want to think carefully about all of those different senses of reproducibility and the purposes that sharing code could be put to. Uh, Within NSF, we have been interested in fostering greater consensus in the field around what uh, approach we should use in requiring public access to code. Uh, some of the things that we funded in my program uh, recently, if you've followed it, are the uh, Ferros RCN Awards. Uh, if you're not familiar with that uh, solicitation, the, I've, I've provided a link in the chat. Uh, basically, this was NSF 22553, and the long acronym stands for FAIR, the FAIR Data Guiding Principles, Open Science, and uh, deploying the mechanism that NSF often uses of RCN's research coordination networks as a way of advancing discussion in the field on a set of, of related research topics. Now, many of the Pharos RCN projects directly speak to the question of reproducibility, how to foster that and advance it in terms of standards adoption, uh, and, uh, further advancement of policy considerations. And while I won't go through all 
28 of the Pharos RCN awards. They were that we made 28 distinct awards that are that comprise 10 related interrelated projects. But one that I'll call out is the Repetto project that is led. It, it's got several um, institutions that are taking part of it, but it is uh, led by Kate Kehi at the University of Chicago. And I think there is a link there to a write up about her project, just giving you a little bit more information about the ways that uh, the Repetto Project and other similar efforts are thinking about uh, fostering more nuance and understanding of reproducibility in code sets and being able to reproduce scientific results uh, in, in consistent ways. So uh, that having said all that, uh, we are thinking right now about uh, coming versions of the NSFPAR and reporting requirements and the specific um, question of, well, should we require code and then how should we require it to be some disseminated is something that we're closely engaged in through all these efforts. And we're following discussions in the field on this topic uh, very closely. So uh, we're very interested in hearing from the field, actually, as we continue to develop our, our own policy uh, and process for sharing information from uh, awards uh, arising from NSF funding. So thank you for the question. And we're sort of paying attention and listening to uh, anybody in the field that has thoughts on this. So I, I welcome further questions or comments from any of your, your listeners on these points. Um, yeah, well, uh, thanks for your comments, Martin. Um, definitely appreciate it. Um, so yeah, let me now turn over with a uh, entry introductory question for Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian, uh, 3IE has had policy regarding the reproducibility of research outputs you fund for a while. And you anchor this approach in a fundamental paradigm of research rigor, combining transparency and ethics in addition to reproducibility. And you actually push, push uh, test push button reproducibility within your organization. So it's not just an empty statement, um, and this is quite unusual in the realm of funders. Uh, so I wonder if you could elaborate on how this focus came about and briefly talk about how it's maintained. Thanks, uh, Ian, for the question, and, and, and thanks to, to, to you and Lars and, and all of the organizers for the uh, invitation to uh, join this panel, and you know, happy to um, share a bit about the evolution of um, uh, computational reproducibility uh, at uh, at 3IE. Um, I, I should I should sort of mention at onset that uh, I've been with the organization now for just about uh, two and a half years, and and I was really fortunate uh, to inherit a very well developed uh, program of computational uh, reprodu reproducibility, and and, and specifically. Um, an area of work that we uh, have sort of denominated the push button replication, um, you know, activities uh, that was developed by, you know, many uh, current and former uh, 3IE uh, colleagues. So, you know, all, all, all of the credit uh, goes to, 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 to them. Um, and I think, I think to understand how this evolved, it's really worth sort of taking a step back um, and and uh, you know rewinding now 15 years uh, to the uh, founding of of, of of 3IE as an organization um, and 3IE was established uh, initially in response to a dearth of rigorous evidence um, from uh, you know from 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 impact evaluations uh, and, and other forms of applied empirical work in in the in the development sector. So the organization, um, you know, focused then and continues to focus now on supporting the production of primary evidence through impact evaluations of uh, evidence synthesis and on translating all of that evidence into, um, into, into practice. So moving the research to practice. Um, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the, the purpose of the work that we fund and support and do in, um, you know, at, at, at 3IE is, is, is not for research sake alone. Um, and, you know, ultimately the driving mission of the organization 
is to uh, improve the lives of the poor and the lower middle income countries through evidence informed decision making that can improve policy formulation and program design. So in order to accomplish that mission, this evidence needs to be credible. And um, computational reproducibility uh, has long been one of the key pillars of 3IE's efforts uh, to promote uh, open and, 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 and ethical research for that, uh, for, for that reason. Um, and I'm going to see if Sarah can help me post uh, a link to our uh, homepage on uh, our, our, our transparent, reproducible, and ethical evidence uh, initiative uh, at 3IE, uh, where you know, participants will be able to see and have access to uh, a whole range of links, including our, our push-button replication um, uh, protocols and, 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 and guidelines and, and, and others. Um, so as, as I mentioned, you know, 3IE uh, has been committed to uh, open science uh, since, its, uh, since its founding 15 years ago. Um, and starting around uh, 2012, uh, the first evidence programs uh, funded by 3IE began generating, uh, ge generating results, so began generating research outputs. And this sort of kicks off a process of, uh, of, of learning, both in, internally within the organization and with our uh, grantees, that results ultimately in the institution of the push button replication as a requirement um, of all 3IE funded and, uh, and, 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 and implemented research programs um, where the, uh, you know, the, the final grant payments and publication of the uh, impact evaluation um, outputs is conditional on a successful uh, on, on a successful push button replication, meaning that the grantee um, uh, doesn't receive their, their their final grant payment unless that 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 ultimate step is is conducted. But how we got there was really was really an evolution, and it, and it, and it and and it evolved gradually uh, over time with a lot of uh, trial and error uh, through throughout that process. Um, Initially, the, uh, the the requirement um, uh, for grantees was uh, the submission of uh, of data and code, um, with the objective of having those data put into the public uh, public domain. Now, the the initial sort of results of that effort were were mixed for a variety of reasons, um, and this uh, you know the, this early these early experiences coincided. With um, a with a with a replication window that was funded by 3IE, uh, where grants were provided to researchers to essentially verify the computational reproducibility of influ influential published studies, um, and 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 that that grant window uh, in, in combination with sort of the early uh, the, the early experiences managing grants at 3IE. Um, you know, led to important lessons on 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 why studies uh, don't reproduce, what barriers to uh, you know re reproducibility um, uh, are, and so on. And so um, these fed in to the development of, uh, of 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 protocols, of um, of training materials, and and of other references that were made available to our grantees and to the you know to the community of practice. At large, um, to be better prepared early on in the funding cycle uh, to design the research in a way that was compatible with open uh, open science principles. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, there, there was a lot of learning that happened uh, a, a lot along the way. Ultimately, around 20, uh, 2018 or so, um, this requirement of um, of, of submitting and passing successfully uh, a push button replication um, and tying that to the final grant payment was instituted uh, and proved to be a very effective um, mechanism, very very effective incentive uh, um, to you know to 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 accomplish that uh, that, that goal. And um, you know if we look just sort of at a at a mapping of the um, 
of the proportion of 3IE funded studies that uh, successfully complete uh, push button replication, meaning that the, uh, the the results are the results in the published study um, can be reproduced, um, you know, almost um, almost precisely to the uh, to, to the results that are in the tables in 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 the study. Uh, that the 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 proportion of studies that are meeting that standard uh, has you know jumped jumped very quickly uh, after after 2018 when this uh, you know when this requirement was. Uh, what was was instituted, um, and so we we do maintain that requirement for all grants and for all internally produced uh, research. Um, and over the past, um, you know, three to four years, uh, have reached uh, rates of successful you know reproducibility upwards of 70, uh, 80 percent. I think even reaching close to 100 percent in some um, in, in some years. So um, it's been it's been you know a, a process. There's been a lot of learning. Um, along the way, and you know, as uh, I'm happy to, you know, share share some of those lessons, some of those um, e experiences uh, later on if we have time. So, uh, thank thanks very much for the question, and back to you. Hopefully, my microphone now actually works. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. I always think that as data editor at a journal where I'm the last step between them and publication, in your step, you're the last step between them getting paid some money. Uh, it's wonderful how, what, how, how incentives actually work, um, but uh, uh, that's not necessarily where it should start, but uh, that's, that's where it ultimately is. Um, let me turn to Stuart. Stuart, you've been involved with um, various funders over the years. Uh, you were at Arnold uh, back when they were a key funder of the Open Science Framework, but Arnold also funds more, at least from the perspective of reproducibility, more challenging disciplines such as criminal justice or things like that. Uh, you're now at the Good Science Project, which uh, I guess wants to promote good science. And um, uh, you're uh, blurb on the website about improving scientific quality is quite provocative. Uh, so let me quote from that before I hand over to you to sort of uh, expand on, on some of those things. Funders need to bend over backwards to incentivize good science rather than low quality science. That facet also calls for a reproducibility project of a funder's portfolio, that funders might want to self-inspect their own portfolio and question their uh, what they funded, whether it actually works. Uh, that kind of approach works a bit later than what 3IE is doing, but it's the kind of monitoring that I think is also important uh, that's been going on with, say, the Institute for Replication that has been working with various journals to do something similar. Can you elaborate a bit on, on your current view of reproducibility in the bigger uh, spectrum of, of good science and, and maybe how you got there or, or how you're taking the good science project there? Sure, yeah, thanks for that uh, intro, Lars. Um, yeah, so so to be uh, clear on definitions, because there are actually so many different kinds of like reproducibility versus replication versus, you know, uh, kind of redoing a study. Um, the the type of reproducibility that I've been, I guess, most involved with uh, in the work at Arnold and the kind of thing that I'm promoting now uh, would be like literally going out and redoing an experiment. So like uh, one of the projects I sponsored while at Arnold was the reproducibility project in psychology, which uh, selected 100 experiments from top psychology journals and then organized several hundred researchers around the world in a kind of gargantuan uh, attempts to literally redo those experiments often with bigger sample sizes than the original. Um, and I, I, so I think that's can, that can be a tremendously valuable exercise uh, for a funder. I, th I think large funders in particular that have the, the sizable portfolio of NIH or NSF or perhaps the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, you know, some of the big private funders, um, I think they should uh, more proactively undertake those kinds of uh, replication projects. On, on a regular basis where you know they have they have some high priority area that they're funding um and i i'm not sure exactly who all has signed up for this uh webinar and what the audience is so this might be a little preaching to the choir but I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that replication of the type that i'm talking about is important because not everyone actually agrees with that um about a month ago i was at a national academies workshop um on experimentation at federal agencies and uh, struck up a conversation with someone who's fairly high up at NIH and the director's office. 
and it was a personal conversation, you know, one-on-one. So I won't, you know, name and shame this person, but um, this, I, I made the argument to this person that uh, the NIH should fund more application projects. And this person uh, said to me something like, you know, this wouldn't really be that valuable. That what, what do we really learn from trying to replicate experiments anyway, or, or, or replicating them exactly? No experiment is ever perfect. So sure, we'll find some discrepancies, but who really cares? What really matters is whether the finding is robust in different contexts. So instead of funding exact replications, we should just fund new work that kind of extends it in a new direction. That's kind of the gist of what that person said to me. Um, and then that NIH uh, official isn't the only person who thinks that way. Um, when the reproducibility project in psychology was uh, coming to an end back in 2014, uh, there's a psychologist at Harvard named Jason Mitchell. Um, he has a neuroscience lab at Harvard who wrote a piece that's still on his website called On the Evidentiary Emptiness of Failed Replications. And uh, this was kind of controversial at the time. Um, but he, he makes an interesting point that's kind of similar to what the NIH person said you know, last month. He said that there are, there, there are like lots of ways to mess up a psychology or neuroscience study. You know, maybe your instrumentation fails or your, your yes, there are lots of ways to mess up. It's very hard to elicit a positive effect, he says. And he also says there's a, a ton of tacit and unwritten knowledge in fields like psychology and neuroscience, and one would presume other fields by analogy as well. And he says that, you know, if, if you look at cooking, if you take a recipe and try to follow it to the letter, but you don't have enough kind of experience as a cook to know what medium heat means or to know how to, how thinly to slice an onion or when the onions are brown, is sufficiently browned in the pan. You may not get the same results as an expert cook, but that doesn't mean the recipe is wrong. It just means that you don't have enough tacit knowledge and skill. And so he suggests that unless replicators do everything perfectly, a, a quote unquote failed replication is uninformative to the readers. Now, obviously, I disagree with those positions, but it, they're still worth addressing because mm -hmm. I, I think that that is a view that's that's out there and it's probably more common than some people maybe publicly admit. Um, so what, what do we learn from trying to replicate studies exactly? Uh, so I put together some thoughts on that. And um, actually, I already sent it to the NIH person, albeit with no, with no response. Um, but uh, I think, number one, at a minimum, you can learn how good the field is at disclosing their methods and the details of how they do experiments. So with a, there was another project that I funded called the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology. Um, and that project found that literally 0% of the time was it even possible to try to replicate a study just based on what was published. Um, and this wasn't because of tacit knowledge, but because there were just obvious steps in every single study that had to have happened but that hadn't been documented very well or at all. So for example, and that this is an issue that would be common across social science and many other sciences as well. For example, they, they found that quote, many original papers failed to report key descriptive and inferential statistics. The data needed to compute effect sizes and conduct power analyses was publicly accessible for just four out of 193 experiments. And despite contacting the authors of the original papers, we were unable to obtain these data for 68% of the experiments. So that's kind of alarming, like in the field of cancer biology, when they're you know, studying things like if you give a mouse that with a tumor, a particular type of tumor, this particular drug, how much does it reduce the tumor? Um, you know, more than two thirds of the time, they don't report just absolutely basic uh, statistics on the, the effect size or the, the sample size, things like that. Um, so, so the people trying to do the replication project, they couldn't even figure out the magnitude of the effect they were trying to replicate or wanted to try to replicate. Um, also, they found that, quote, none of the 193 experiments were described in sufficient detail in the original paper. So uh, that means like they didn't fully describe the materials they used or the antibodies or the, the lines of cells that they were working with and so forth. Uh, so in every single case, they had to reach out to the original lab, uh, which more than half the time was uncooperative or claimed not to recall what had actually happened in the study. Um, and the 41% the of the time that they, the labs were cooperative, the answer was, always, you need more materials than we than we mentioned in the study. Um, so, so the studies, the replication studies always ended up taking longer and costing more than anyone could have planned. And so I, so I think that kind of, kind of grand scale replication project in cancer biology is kind of an indictment of the field, it, whether or not, you know, the results show that that's, the studies are replicable, it still shows that it's really, really hard to even try to replicate something. Okay, so now if, it's a second possibility, though, that's if repli how replication can be informative. So if a study is successfully replicated, 
and we can argue about what exactly what that means, uh, then you learn you can have more confidence in that line of work. And with so much irreproducibility and sometimes outright fraud, it's good to have an idea of what to trust. I mean, last year we learned that there was a, a prominent Alzheimer's study from around 15 years ago that was likely fraudulent. It was this huge story in science, big investigation, um, a systematic replication of project in Alzheimer's research might have turned up uh, that study as problematic, you know, long before it had been, you know, used and cited in, in countless other studies, um, 15, you know, for the next well over a decade. Um, so uh, a third point is, you know, what do we make of it when studies uh, can't really be replicated or, or you replicate it and the effect, the effect size is much smaller or non-existent? Um, is that indeed uninformative as the, you know, folks at Harvard and NIH have said. Um, so let's take an example, again, from the uh, project in cancer biology. Uh, the bottom line results there that were that when they did 50 replication experiments from 23 original papers, uh, by the way, that's a lot less than they start to, started out at the beginning of the project, and that's just because they literally couldn't even try to replicate most of the experiments. Uh, but so for 50 the replication, replication experiments they actually could do, um, they found that the effect sizes were 85% smaller on average than the original findings. Um, and the original positive results were only half as likely to replicate successfully as original null results, um, which may not be surprising. There's just bias towards positive results in the literature. Um, so, so I do think there's something you can learn from that kind of finding. Um, so, so number one, it, it is possible that the replication team isn't very good or doesn't have enough tacit knowledge or made a simple mistake somewhere. Um, so that's, that is a, log a logical possibility. But I would say we, we can see that like so many pharmaceutical companies can't replicate more than a third of the academic literature. And they have every incentive to try to replicate stuff because they, they are hoping to find something that works in order to uh, develop a drug and bring it to market. They have highly qualified staff. They've, you know, they're well-funded. Um, but there are multiple pharma companies, including Amgen and Bayer, that have uh, publicly reported that they can't replicate most of the academic literature. And uh, in conversations with uh, officials at Pfizer and AbbVie, I've heard the exact same story that they say, yeah, when we try to replicate something from academia, it won't, we can't get it to work two thirds of the time. Um, so I, I think that is informative. I think that's telling us something about our ability to make scientific progress in a particular field. Um, so another, another possibility with a failed replication um, is that the original study can't be fully trusted for any number of reasons. Maybe there was improper randomization, improper treatment of outliers, some other questionable use of statistics, p-hacking, maybe there's publication bias, um, maybe it was just a fluke. And we don't know any of that just because of a one failed replication, but at least we have uh, some reason to think that there might be uh, some questionable research practices that would turn up on further investigation. Um, and a third possibility when there's a failed replication is that the original study was indeed correct, but it just wasn't fully specified. Perhaps there was some key factor that no one thought was important to report, but that actually turned out to be important. Um, so again, from cancer biology, there's, a, there's this great article by Mina Bissell, who's at Harvard, um, where she and a team uh, from the Bay Area uh, were working together on a series of experiments that were trying to isolate some breast cancer cells. And they kept finding that they just couldn't get the same results from what should have been a basic study. Um, and they tried for a year comparing methods. Um, they were, again, they were working together. They couldn't you know, replicate within their own you know, collaborative project. And so finally, they just started traveling back and forth across the country and to just watch exactly what each lab was doing at every specific step. And the, the one difference they found was that at a particular point in the experiment, when they're stirring, they put, put the cells in a mach this machine that stirs it um, with this material called collagenase to try to separate out certain cells. W well, one of the teams was putting in a machine that stirred it for like six hours at a, at a fairly high rate. The other team was putting in a machine that stirred it for like 20 hours at a slower rate. And that in itself somehow ended up making a difference to the profile of the breast cancer cells that they were trying to study. And they had no idea before that. So that kind of thing seems like it would be hugely important to know, because if you go back to what the NIH official told me that, you know, we shouldn't bother with direct exact replications because um, we don't learn as much. Instead, we should just try to build on, on, on previous work and, and push it in a new direction. Well, I think that's potentially dangerous um, in, in a lot of cases, because what if, imagine that the Harvard team did their study by themselves, published that, imagine that the Bay Area team took that result and tried to build on it, 
And they pushed, they, you know, added, they added some new factors, you know, some, some, something different, you know, they wanted to study a new topic that was related, but unbeknownst to them, they changed the rate of stirring as well. And they didn't know that was important. And now when they reach new results or different results in their new study, that's building on the Harvard study, they would attribute it. They might attribute it falsely to some new factor they thought they were studying. And they wouldn't even know about this like hidden moderator of like the, uh, the, the rate of stirring that turned out to be so important. And I think that uh, that's an observation I think applies to lots and lots of areas, so, certainly in social science. I mean, in social science, we see lots of problems with uh, people trying to scale or, or you know, um, kind of generalize from one uh, location to another. Uh, it may be that there are all sorts of factors about location, context, the, the local population, the local economy, the local religious and cultural values, um, and so forth and so on, that turn out to be important to the whether or not you can implement some economic intervention or some educational intervention or you know, an intervention to prevent teen pregnancy or what have you. Um, and I think it's that trying to directly replicate um, across different contexts could help isolate which factors are actually important. So I think, uh, you know, bottom line, I think direct replications are important and uh, big funders like NIH, NSF especially should think about ways to put some money uh, towards that on a more regular basis. That's all I got. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, I, I mean, one of the ways that I tend to think of uh, reproducibility, replicability as a continuum is that if we want to build on the prior science, we need to actually learn about um, how to actually implement it. So the idea that skill or the secret component or this other moderator is important, that's part of the whole process. Uh, I'm about to take a plane. I sure hope that pilot can replicate his, uh, his result from yesterday where he successfully landed the plane. But that's, uh, and maybe it is that in order to do the right kitchen recipe, you need a mandolin that actually slices the onion in exactly the right way. And that's a mechanical way of implementing what took an artisanal skill in the first place. So I think those are important parts. Let me then throw open the, the discussion to all. Um, we've heard various approaches. Uh, NSF is moving forward. 3IE has already been doing it. Um, Stuart has talked about the importance of broader application that is not necessarily always finding um, support uh, at funders. Um, let me start with uh, you, Martin. I mean, part of what NSF role is, is to moderate also what panels say about, and the panels are reflective of what's in the science. So there's sort of this feedback loop about uh, being able to actually convince others that this is important. Stuart's point about that there is still pushback on whether this is a valid exercise. Uh, how do we break that? And what's the role of funders within that? It's a great question, and let me commend both of my fellow panelists. Um, I'm very impressed with the uh, the level of commitment of their their um, organizations to these questions. I think it is a question to you know NSF is always driven by the scientific communities that we serve. We we are integral uh, with those communities. We are informed by emerging topics from those communities. So. It is a um, intertwined question of how do we raise the importance and recognition of reproducibility in the minds of the research communities that we serve uh, to get it reflected in the panels um, exactly in the way that you're suggesting. Uh, I love the idea, for example, Sebastian, that you've got you know push button reproducibility as a requirement on the on the end of a, a an award. Um, that will undoubtedly would undoubtedly require a really high level of compliance checking. Um, for example, you know a lot of follow-ups, um, a lot of uh, iter you know unpacking of DMPs, for example, data management plans specifically around what obligations for reproducibility are going to be uh, enforced, uh, expected out of out of research work. And the acknowledgement of the uh, people in the review panels that that's a really critical factor. And as you heard in some of the anecdotes that, that some of the others shared, um, not everybody is, is totally committed to that prospect. I agree very much, though, that it should be a, uh, a very significant factor for research integrity, transparency, research, and all the reasons 
that are given in that that NASM study I, I cited, as well as all, all the rationale that uh, the others on this panel shared. Sebastian, have you found that the requirement to actually do something at the end, I mean, you found that of those studies that you fund and where people have applied to it, that you're now in some years at 100% compliance with that. Has that changed who actually applies for your grants, knowing that they have to satisfy the condition at the end? That, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, we could we we could look into this, but um, you know, my, my sense that rather it's been a, a, a learning process. It's been an evolution within the you know community um, of, of of researchers that you know practice in lower and middle income countries in the social sectors, um, which is you know primarily sort of our our target audience. Um, you know, or, or, and, and I, one of the things that we have discovered along the way, I think, is that um, the the um, you know the, the end result of having computationally reproducible um, results actually starts at the beginning, and so we needed to develop a whole set of you know of tools, protocols, training, working with our grantees, working internally on building capacity within 3IE. Uh, so that this could actually materialize. It didn't happen. Didn't happen overnight. It was an uphill battle uh, along the way. And let me just give you one one example. Um, so uh, one of the um, stumbling blocks that we experienced, you know, early on was that um, data um, may not be um, able to be shared with us or published openly uh, because the appropriate um, permissions had been sought in the informed consent and in the institutional review board approval. And so those are very difficult, um, you know, difficult obstacles to overcome um, ex post if the, you know, researcher actually has a, a limitation on being able to share their data by almost by, by, by default, it's going to be very difficult to reproduce those, those, those results. And so um, working, you know, work, working backwards to the um, research design at the inception phase, so that uh, informed consents are written in a way where data can be uh, shared openly and used for secondary analysis, right? Um, and including those uh, approvals uh, in the in, in, in the IRB process and so on. So getting all of the conditions built into the research design from the ground up then translates into much you know much better opportunities for having. Uh, computational, re computationally reproducible um, uh, research coming coming through. So it's you know it's 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 definitely been been, been a process. One one tool that I will plug um, and then hand it back to you, Lars, is that we've recently launched um, what we call the, uh, the 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 tree review framework. Tree being transparent, uh, reproducible, and ethical research, uh, which is a essentially a, a long detailed checklist which allows researchers to uh, verify and it, uh, at inception and document that they are in fact, uh, you know, implementing uh, what we think are the, the, the key best practices in, in, in open science, including uh, the, you know, the, the requirements for getting uh, push button replicable <laughs> uh, research. So back to you. Yeah, and I'll I'll counter your plug with another plug for one of our earliest sessions in this series where we were talking about some of the ethical considerations as they relate to reproducibility. And that has to start at the beginning, which is where uh, that's why I brought up the data management plans. That's something you submit before you even get the money for it, and it's verified at the end. But on the other hand, the more requirements we lay on to research before it has even started, people might be less interested about uh, participating in that. I mean, um, just before I sort of uh, hand over to Stuart and to, to Martin again, one of the things that I've seen emerge now that there are actually active data editors, such as myself, my colleague Marie, who's not here today, and others, is that people are taking that into consideration. And I have had people approach us and say, I can't publish this data, but when I signed the data use agreement with a provider, I actually inserted a clause that I can give you the data, uh, at least for the purpose of verification, if not for publication. And that's exactly the kind of change we want to see ingrained and disseminated as that it's actually possible to do that. So please think ahead because it's really hard to do it afterwards. It's not impossible. You send off people to sort of ask for permission after the fact as well, or add us to protocols or things like that. Um, before I go to 
to you, Martin. Uh, Stuart, um, is there a role for sort of adversarial checking of what, uh, I mean, the, the kind of idea of, of sort of rolling something up that is now being uh, to some extent uh, funded through the, say, Institute for Replication or that your 100 labs experiment uh, as it was funded by Arnold, those were adversarial checking implicitly on what other funders have been funding, be they NIH or others. Is that the way to go? Is that like, does it need somebody out there to just throw the occasional light into the dark uh, caverns of, of reproducibility? I think so. And I do think funders should put a higher priority on that. I mean, I'm tempted, I have a for, I'm formerly a lawyer and you know, a, a failed lawyer, I guess, or a converted lawyer, whatever you want to say. Um, but I do see an advantage to a certain aspect of the legal system. The legal system is inherently adversarial. You have um, you know, in any legal case, you know, you have a prosecutor or a defender, you have a, you know, the plaintiff's lawyer and the defendant's lawyer. And so you, that, that in a sense keeps you honest. You've still got the judge or, and or jury that can make decisions that hopefully, ideally, are trying to arrive at the truth, whether that's in the middle or whether that's on one side or the other. But it, it keeps both sides more honest when they know that, okay, if I say something that's false or I, you know, fail to tell the court about something important, the other side is going to make me look bad. And so, uh, so that kind of adversarial nature is, uh, you know, something that does, I think, help help keep lawyers more honest than they would otherwise be. You're not um, thinking of recently settled cases or something like that, right? <laughs> well, uh, uh, you know, no comment. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think that there, there are plenty of examples of, you know, I mentioned the Alzheimer's fraud. There are examples of like literal fraud in the scientific literature that wasn't discovered for decades. Um, until, you know, some, usually some amateur or anonymous person uh, who was sufficiently motivated to say, this looks fishy. And then they discover discrepancies that where you say that, okay, this data obviously can't be true. It can't be real. Um, and, and I think that a little more of that kind of in skepticism and adversarial scrutiny uh, would help keep more scientists honest, because right now, I mean, that that's kind of scrutiny it doesn't happen in peer review for the most part. Um, and if it's relegated to just anonymous, you know, boards like PubPeer and so forth, then, it, you know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't happen often enough or in a high profile way enough to, to make much difference. So, so yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. We need more of that. Martin, do we need a red team directorate at NSF? Would love it. And that that's part of, so, so that's part of my uh, question I was going to ask. Actually, if uh, Sebastian or Stuart, if you have a sense of, um, it may be hard to quantify this or 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 uh, come up with any generalizable um, statistics, but I'm curious what the the additional costs are of a, to add to an award on on average to reach uh, what you're calling push button reproducibility. Uh, you know what? Uh, what kinds of resources do does, for example, three IE uh, allocate to that? Both in terms of uh, your your organizational capacity to assess it, and what do you add to awards to enable your awardees to achieve that level of reproducibility? If if there are any generalizable observations that you can share, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. So. Um... I don't think we've attempted to actually fully cost this out, um, but we do work with uh, grantees and in our uh, in our own internal uh, work to you know to include this as a cost item in terms of you know time and labor that is going to be uh, needed to be able to uh, you know get all of the data and code and so on up to the standards of passing a PBR. I think again the earlier that this is a part of the overall research program, the less costly it becomes. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it is, it is, you know, working towards that objective. If I know as a researcher that ultimately, you know, the data and code are going to need to be, you know, are going to need to replicate um, and, you know, someone else, an independent uh, you know, evaluator. We have a small team in 3IE that we, uh, you know, essentially subsidize internally uh, to do this work. Uh, they will spend uh, several hours. Um, typically, uh, I think we, you know, budget around a day of, a, of an analyst's time uh, to, to sit down and 
um, and, and, and actually, you know, run the reproduction. So, you know, I, it could be an hour. If it's a question of just getting the path changed and you click do on the do file and everything comes out neatly. Uh, and it could be several days <laughs> if, 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 you know, if it's a big mess and we have to go back and forth uh, many times with the, with, with, with the research team. Um, but, but on average, you know, we're, we're, we're usually estimating uh, five to eight hours uh, for, for this process to be completed, including, you know, all of the back and forths and, 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 so, and quality checks and so on. So um, there, is a, there is a cost, there's, there's un, un, undoubtedly a cost. Um, again, I think that that cost, at least the cost that's assumed by the research team um, can be, uh, you know, reasonably marginal if it is uh, factored in um, upfront and can also be then accounted for in the research proposal. So I actually build in uh, time and resources explicitly to be able to cover those costs. Well, for what it's worth, I, I absolutely commend it. And I agree with you, Stuart, that uh, this needs more attention. Uh, and I can say that there is interest in federal agencies in this broad in these set, sets of questions of transparency, increasing transparency and reproducibility in reviews. Um, I, I had Sarah put a uh, link in the chat to this uh, uh, government-wide initiative, open.science.gov, open the uh, Year of Open Science Initiative among more than a dozen major federal agencies right now. And one of the goals of this effort is to examine and align our expectations and practices in federal review panels around increasing rigor, transparency, and uh, attention to reproducibility. So I, I very much agree with, with your sentiment, Stuart. Um, I, I think it, it would, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of interest in this broadly among federal agencies right now. So it's very timely. Okay. Um... So looking forward to um, many more uh, verifications and uh, exposed or ex ante introduction of these. Uh, I'm sympathetic to that, which is in part why we actually had earlier in the uh, CREST webinar series a, um, a session on undergraduate education. And I saw that Richard Ball was actually among the attendees and, and he was a participant in that. And to close out our, our webinar series, the last one will be on incorporating this into graduate education, uh, which is kind of where it has to start. And uh, to some extent, those graduate students are our next cohort of re reviewers. And when uh, the next generation thinks that this is just the obvious thing to do, uh, then, uh, then uh, that, that's different. I think they also need to know that it's technically feasible. Um, so, um, um, I am out of questions at this point, so I'm opening up the floor uh, to any other um, uh, steward if you want to uh, talk back to Martin about uh, what he should be doing or something like that. <laughs> Open up to more discussion at this point. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, I, I could have more specific advice for NSF. I mean, if, if you were thinking about <laughs> replication projects, you know, my suspicion would be that, you know, social behavioral sciences and STEM education programs are probably... Uh, right for some replication efforts, less probably less necessary in other areas that that you find like mathematics or astronomy. Mathematics, there's a strong culture of like trying to replicate someone else's analysis for yourself. Um, astronomy, there was a great Netflix documentary on the Event Horizon Telescope that came up with the first picture of the black hole, and NSF sponsored along with a lot of other agencies. And they built in replicate. It's such a big project. They built in like kind of the idea of replication from the start. They had multiple teams in this on screen, like that were you know, kind of firewalled from each other and had independent access to the data. And then they had this like kind of big reveal ceremony to, where they revealed like, did we actually reach the same results and can we trust our results? And everybody was excited because they did. Um, so I think there are some disciplines where you know replication is already kind of part of the culture, and others where it isn't. So it'd be. Yeah, you know, I think really helpful to to focus in on those. Thank you. Okay, um, so um, we're running out of time, so I want to uh, be conscious of that. Uh, so let me uh, thank all of our speakers here today: uh, Martin Halbert, Sebastian Martinez, and Stuart Buck for presenting and for having a, a, a very good discussion. And who knows, ideas for the future. Um, 
our next session uh, is on May 30th uh, at a somewhat unusual time because we've incorporated it into the Canadian Economics uh, Association meetings on May 30th at 10.30 a.m. Central Time, uh, so 11.30 Eastern Time. We're going to talk about something that's connected to what we're doing here. It's on reproducibility, confidentiality, and open data mandates in the Canadian scientific uh, uh, enterprise. And we've got a, uh, an awesome panel sitting there. So I um, I incite everybody to uh, sign up for that. Um, the link is on our website. It's not going to be our usual Zoom link up, uh, but we're going to have an interesting conversation there as well. And as I mentioned, the last one for this um, for the season will be on uh, graduate education and reproducibility training, uh, which Ian will lead, uh, which is then uh, the last one in June. Um, and we have some ideas. If other folks have ideas as well, we're open to ideas on how to continue this in the fall. Uh, so thank you again very much. And um, thank you all for coming. <laughs>